Okay, we're going to get started. Um, there might be a couple of, because we've got the break on, there might be a couple of other people that come in, but if not, that's good. So, uh, hi, welcome. Uh, my name's Justin McLean. Um, this, I'm going to talk about a FlexJS case study, and you might say, hey, wait a second, that's not on the schedule. Uh, we're supposed to be talking about testing FlexJS. Well, um, currently things are a bit broken with FlexUnit and FlexJS. I'm yet to come up with a decent workflow that, that works, basically. Um, and I could talk for probably 20 minutes on that, and it probably wouldn't tell you much you don't already know. So I thought a more useful use of both your and my time would be to talk about a real-life case study about a FlexJS application that we actually have deployed live. Um, so it's out there and people are using it. So um, do we know of any other, I know of one other live project that uses FlexJS. Do we know of any others? Okay, so that's three that we know of that are, that are, that are out there. That's a good start. <laughs> we also plan to start using FlexJS for administration panels, so mm -hmm. we will have this okay soon. Okay, there we go, that's four. That's two more than I knew of a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> that's, that's all great. Um, so just who am I? Um, I'm a freelance developer. I've been programming for about 25 years. Um, I'm on the Incubator PMC, the Flex PMC, plus a few other PMCs. I'm a Apache member. I'm also a mentor for several uh, incubating projects. I've been developing uh, Flex since version 1.5, way, way, way back when it was actually a sort of more of a server-side thing. It, like used to compile ActionScript on the server and push it up to the browser, which is um, a long time ago. Um, that was actually for... Um, uh, News Limited in Australia, and that uh, was at one point in time the biggest flex application deployed. I, I assume other sites since surpassed it and all the rest, but you know, small claim to fame. <laughs> um, I've been the re release manager for the Flex SDK several times, and I've fixed hundreds, if not probably a thousand bugs in the Flex SDK. Um, I haven't done that much work on the FlexJS side of things. Uh, but since starting this project, I've started to, to fix a few bugs and suggest a few changes and so forth. Um, um, if you've come to any of my other talks here, I've had three other talks. I'm also interested in IoT and that space, and I run the IoT sit, uh, meetup in Sydney. So if you're ever in Sydney, Australia, come look me up. So the case study. Uh, a bit of background first. So this was an existing project. Um, it was a Flex legacy application. It had a huge amount of technical debt. Um, it was written by one person. And generally, if you're a single coder who's not on a team, you may fall into some bad habits. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just, just how things are. Like, you don't use version control. You put everything in one file. You know, I'm sure everyone's seen, <laughs> seen stuff like that. Um, there was also a Flex mobile application, and there was an existing back-end system and database. Um, they had tried to port the application to FlexJS, uh, but this we're talking sort of version 0.7, or, or around there, not, uh, about six months ago. Um, and they just found it was too hard, uh, mostly because a lot of the UI stuff was missing, and also uh, just trying to get things to compile was was difficult. It's trying to get FlexJS to compile and trying to use FlexJS to compile things. Um, so they, and I'll explain a bit about the project in a minute, they had a large amount of new functionality they wanted to add to the existing project, um, and they decided the best thing to do was to rewrite it from scratch. So that's actually a sensible decision. <laughs> it's, it's, it means it makes things a lot easier. Um, but you have to, you know, you still have to keep some of the existing functionality, and we still have to integrate with the existing database to some extent. Um, the client also was adamant that um, that it, it it had to be written in JS. It couldn't be Swift in the browser. It couldn't be a mobile application. It couldn't be a desktop application. They had a a, a fairly hard requirement for that, um, and you'll. I'll, explain why that is in a, in, a, in a minute. So the application itself is a framework for building communities, and it's based around uh, diversion and uh, diversity and inclusion, which is sort of an, a, an interesting project. Um, 
We've been working on it for about three months. Uh, there's only two developers and they're only on it about 50% of the time. And so we've had to set up from scratch the front end, back end and development infrastructure. Um, we're only outputting JavaScript. Um, we may possibly use Swift, ActionScript, Air, whatever, uh, for the mobile application in the future, but currently we're just using the existing mo mobile application and, and going with that. Um, there's one front end server, one DB server. Um, that we're going to have to scale that, so we're going to have to start thinking about what we're going to do. Eventually this system is going to have millions of users. Uh, so it, 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 yeah, we'll have to look into that quite quickly. <laughs> um, the existing team needed some education about modern development practices. <laughs> they didn't use version control. They had no idea what CI was. Uh, they didn't uh, even have a bug issue system. Uh, so all that sort of thing we had to, to, to convince in a nice way that, you know, maybe you want to use this. <laughs> so. So there's one framework, and it actually serves multiple sites and domains. Uh, and most of there's a, 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 a large overlap in functionality between all of these sites, but um, it can be different. It is currently live, and people are using it. So uh, at the moment, it's fairly limited in its functionality, and we, we, it's a, a gradual rollout, and we're going to add more and more things. Uh, basically, every two weeks, we have another delivery where they get a big chunk of functionality. So this is sort of what it looks like. Um, it's fairly simple in terms of design, but it doesn't look like your average flex application. Things move around the screen and animate a little bit. Um, there's quite a lot of navigation in there. Uh, it, it tends to you know, work quite nicely and well. The, uh, the person who runs this company has a, a background in industrial design. Um, so he loves uh, design. And it, one of the interesting things that has happened... Yeah, sure. So the same code base for desktop and the mobile application? No, no. Currently, the, the mobile application is separate. Okay. We may move to one code base for, for, for both of them. Uh, the, the site itself is responsive. Uh, and again, I'll speak a little bit about that a, a, a little later. Yeah, if you have any questions uh, as you go along, please stick up your hand and, and, and I'll ask them. Um, yeah, so back to the, the, the user of the site. Um, one of the interesting things that has happened that since... Um, since we put everything in version control, uh, the, uh, the person who runs, uh, runs the project, uh, he's a bit of a designer, um, and he absolutely loves version control because it means he can go in and change things. Uh, before he was too scared to change something and that he couldn't change the colours or something or couldn't you know, rearrange things a little bit. And so he's actually starting to write a little bit of code himself. Uh, he sometimes gets it wrong. <laughs> But that's okay. Any check-ins only revert away, and we're, we're, we're quite happy with that. Um, and I'll explain a bit about our infrastructure and how we've, we've set that up uh, for the, the small team that we have uh, at the end of this talk. So um, here's what we've done in those few months. Uh, so you can see that uh, it's mostly MXML and ActionScript. Uh, that sort of 50-50 split is pretty typical for most projects I've worked on, Flex, Flex SDK and FlexJS. Um, there's a bit of CSS in there, most of that, and JavaScript, most of those are some third-party uh, application uh, libraries we're using. Um, we're using a third-party date chooser, for example. Um, so it's sort of nice that you can take existing JavaScript and you can, without a lot of effort, you can make it work. We, we, we've sort of hacked it together a little bit, I have to say, in this way. We have not gone the whole let's make a type diff and compile it in ActionScript and JavaScript and you know, all the rest. Um, we have reasonably limited uh, timeframes and budgets, so there's, there's some constraints on what we can do and what we can't do. Uh, but you can see there, there's about 15, maybe 20, 15 to 20,000 lines of code. So it's, it's a getting to be a sizable project. It's not huge at this stage, but it will certainly grow as time goes on. Um, you might notice one Cold Fusion file there. <laughs> um, just by coincidence, the back end has, happens to be written in Cold Fusion, which when they first got me on the project, um, I was only brought on to work on the front end of it. Um, and they said, oh, by the way, do you know anything about this? And it's like, uh, yeah, I do actually. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to admit that, but... 
<laughs> so yeah, that's, that's just how it is. Yep, as I said, there's one code base, many sites. Um, so there are several clients that are also using this, the same code base. All of them have different requirements. Um, so what we've come up with is a way of making it so it's uh, domain name driven. So each domain name comes into the same site. Uh, we basically s sniff what domain it comes in on, and then we do some things based on that uh, on that domain. Um, we also have dev domains of of every single live site as well, uh, so we can uh, uh, check that out ourselves. The uh, we're using feature toggles. Is it, if people are familiar with that term? Feature toggles? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not whether a build includes a feature, because it, it, what, what it means is the database actually contains a list of sites and what features each site has, and that's loaded on startup of the application. So it means that you can turn features on and off on a per site basis, and it also means you can, you can deploy something uh, and sort of deploy it silently, and then once you're happy with it, just turn it on. So you don't even have to do a, a, a proper deployment to be able to turn a feature on. You just got, just got to tick a little box in the database. So that, that's sort of a nice way of doing it. Um, not, not that it's pretty complex to deploy this application. Um, initially, when we started working on this, as I said, they had no CI server, no real development process. And so all they were doing was just uh, FTPing up to a live server, uh, which is uh, maybe not ideal. <laughs> Um, site, the, each of the sites have different styling as well, and that's also database driven. Um, it's, it's cached, so it's not, you know, there's no performance issues or anything like that. Um, and, and as I said, there's both a, a dev site and a live site for, for each of the domain names. Currently, there are six different sites. Um, in the next month, it's probably going to expand out to about 12. So, um, and some of those will get lightly used, and some of those will get um, as I said, up to um, probably millions of users a month, uh, as, as in the next six months. So, um, over those three months, what have, what, what have we learned? Um, for FlexJS, uh, general layout, simple styling, works really well. You can uh, use containers and groups to lay things out horizontally and vertically. You don't have to muck around with floats and all that mess that CSS gives me a headache. It works well now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, there has been some trouble along the way. And I have now, after this slide, I think I've got about a 20 slides of the issues we ran into. So, <laughs> so but, but um, responsive design, you, you can make simple responsive design with FlexJS sites. Uh, so this application does actually work on a mobile phone. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's, it actually still does what it needs to do. Um, we're making HTTP calls, uh, servers to the servers, they're returning JSON. Um, that was all really simple and just worked. Uh, again, that was a, a, a nice plus. I was thinking I was going to have all sorts of problems with that. Um, you can use the same, if you're used to MXML and, and Flex, you can use a component style architecture. But you can't extend all of the components, which is a bit of a pain. Um, and we've run into this a couple of times. There's FlexJS components that you can't extend. Um, it's not designed in the same way, and, and that's on purpose. Uh, in your talk, you were talking about uh, the strands and the beads and that you don't want these big, large inheritance trees. Yeah, so. So, um, yeah, so we, we, it's, again, it's more a different way of thinking. Uh, but if you're coming from the MXML Flex SDK world, that, that's something you need to need to put into consideration. Uh, simple binding works. I've had some issues with complex binding stuff, but uh, generally you just rewrite your code in a slightly different way, and and it and it works. Um, basic animation and effects work really well. They perform really well as well, which surprised me. I was I assumed we were going to get all sorts of issues with things just going you know up the screen and like that, but. No, um, custom event dispatching works really well, so you can make uh, MVC style applications uh, without a lot of a, a lot of issues. Um, and states work really well. That really surprised me because states are these horrible, complex things, um, but it just works. So that's that's all good. So yeah, a question. Are you using 
using some framework or DCI? I mean, like pure MVC or something like that? Uh, the question was, am I using a framework like pure MVC or something like that? Mm -hmm. The answer is no. Okay. Uh, the Flex JS and SDK is a framework on itself, and it's very easy to do MVC in that framework. Oh, yeah. If you just create a data model uh, um, and create views, and then bind to that data model in the views, dispatch events when things change, have some sort of controller that reacts to those changes, that's MVC right there. So, uh, another question? Yeah, um, you said you uh, call the server with JSON, so do you have some way of sort of getting a strongly typed model? Uh, the question was, we call the server with JSON, and do we have some way of getting the strongly typed model? The answer is no, we don't. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, currently we're just sending back, uh, in most cases, just untyped objects. Uh, so, but the, the calls know what they're doing, and so we've got this little uh, layer which returns strongly typed objects, but when it's talking to the server, it's just getting a loose, loosely typed object that, that, that it, it tries to match up all the fields and so forth. So, as far as the rest of the application is concerned, all that is strongly typed. But as far as the, the actual layer that makes the call is concerned, it's not. Um, that is one of the things I'd like to improve, but we just haven't, we haven't had any really good ideas about how, what was the, be the best way to do that. So, um, risks. Um, there are some features missing in the Flex SDK. Uh, that if you come from a Flex, sorry, a Flex in Flex.js, if you come from Flex SDK, you may expect these things to be there and they're not. So you might either have to do without or work around them. Uh, there is certainly a lack of documentation. Uh, it, it is improving, and there is, I'm not saying there is no documentation, but uh, some of the things are difficult to work out, um, particularly when it comes to knowing, for example, what beads to use where. That's, there's, it seems to be a, a large number of beads, and it's not very clear about how they're named, where exactly they should be used. Particularly with the binding beads, I've noticed they, they tend to have similarly confusing names, and it's like, well, do I use that one here or not here? And a lot of the times it's just, let's just try it, see what it works. Um, yeah, that works, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, there are several bugs in the SDK and in, in FlexJS. Uh, things have changed over those three months, and they will break your build on occasion. Uh, because releases are far apart, uh, we haven't had a release for like six months or so, we have to rely on the nightly builds and the snapshots, um, and that means things break. Um, they may break your build, well, they may break your layout as well. There's, there's been a few changes there. Um, basically, these risks can be mitigated. Just keep a close eye on the, the mailing list and the check-ins. Um, we also compile a, a number of, of applications and keep them. So if anything does break, we can revert to a, a, a known good one, uh, which is probably a good strategy to, to have. So state of play. Well, it's, FlexJS is probably not quite 100% ready for prime time, but it's about 95% there, I would say. Uh, we have run into a number of issues. And I'm going to go through those, um, but I'm, don't, this is not going to turn into a it has all these bugs type session. <laughs> it's every single issue we ran, ran into had a workaround. Um, and that's sort of interesting and it shows some of the flexibility that FlexJS has in that uh, there are many ways of doing the same thing. Uh, and quite often, if you can't do something one way because there's a bug, you can do it another way and it, it works. So trying to find out which way to do it is sometimes uh, you have to be creative, but, but uh, as you'll see, but we'll, you'll, uh, yeah, you can do it. Um, yeah, another question. Um, you said you can work around. How difficult has it been for you as, as a long-time committer Flex to actually debug the, the bugs? Uh, how difficult has it been for me to debug the bugs in Flex.js? Um, some of the bugs have been relatively easy to, to work out, uh, particularly the more framework style bugs. Uh, bugs in the compiler are really, really difficult to work out, and we've run into a few of those as well. The compiler just tends to give random exceptions and says, ah, something's gone wrong. Oh, build succeeded. 
<laughs> it's like, no, no, that's not good. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but most of them have been relatively easy to work out. Um, some of them, it's been difficult to work out the correct way of fixing them, um, as per some discussions on the mailing list that you, you, may, you may have read. Um, some of these issues have been fixed in recent versions of the SDK. Uh, I sort of note that on most of the slides, but there may be one or two things there that have been fixed and I haven't realised it yet, because uh, we're still using the workaround in our, in our code. Um, so if you are making a FlexJS application at this point in time, you can expect some lost productivity due to these issues. But productivity is pretty high. Um, you saw the screenshots before. You know that that was two developers, three months, half time. That's reasonably good progress, I would say, to get a, an application from nothing to out the door live. Um, a good way to check this is write lots of examples. Have lots of simple examples that illustrate what the bug is, um, and then rerun them occasionally to see whether things have been fixed or not. So anyway, so the, uh, here are the issues and the bugs that we ran into. One of the first ones we ran into was can't set background colors. <laughs> That's what you want to be able to do. Um, the first workaround we, we managed to find was you can use the named HTML colors <laughs> to set things. So you can set things to be red and brown and purple and white and canary yellow and <laughs> you know, all the rest. And that seems to work fine. Um, there has been some fixes in the framework. So you can use uh, hash RGB and RGBA as well. Um, that code was a little broken. It hasn't 100% been sorted out. There's still some issues there that I've run into occasionally, particularly when dealing with alphas that just it just doesn't seem right. And I, but I, I don't know what the what the issues are there. Um, I'm also from a developer background, and I'm not a, really a designer. So it's it's mostly the the designer in our team who comes along and complains and says, "Hey, you know that's." Alpha's 10% out. It's like, uh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> hey, it looks good to me. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's, that's how it is. Um, containers ignore padding. Um, this padding has changed in the last three months, and there was a lot of fixes put into it. However, it is still broken, in my opinion. Um, so if you do something like this, uh, and I compiled this last night and, and, and ran it, um, what you should get is a 100 by 100 red square with a 60 by 60 white square in the middle of it. You don't. <laughs> uh, well, sorry. <clears throat> you do if you do it like this. Uh, and you do if you do it like this is because you're using fake padding. And what you've done is set, is set the x and y coordinates there. So... This will display a red square, oh, oh, sorry, a white square inside a red square with a 20 pixel border around it. So you can get around things without padding. Um, that doesn't work. <laughs> so if you just put padding equals 20 on something, you, you just get a square. If you put margin equals 20 on it, it does work. So there's something going on there that it's, quite, it's almost right, but not quite right. And it's probably to do with, yes? Mm -hmm. Horizontal layout with padding and gap, yeah. and vertical layout with padding and gap, and those seem to work. Yeah. Um, so you might want to give those a try. Okay, so I was just told that a couple of new beads have been added to the SDK that were horizontal layout with padding and gap, and vertical layout with padding and gap. Have I got those, yep. those right? Yeah. Yeah. And so they may be the way to go with that. But you know, again, you, just by setting X and Y, you can sort of get a, get around it in a, in a lot of cases. Uh, conditional compilation. It doesn't seem to work under all conditions. I do not know why. Uh, I put compile JS around things, and it wants to compile it in ActionScript and says, nah, you can't do that. Sorry, here's an error. So anyway, um, you can sort of work around this in, in most cases. You, I found that if you tend to set it as functions and put compile Swift, compile JS around the functions, that tends to fix it. Uh, the other way of doing it is just using bracket notation rather than dot notation. Um, and it'll allow you to do anything with that. Um, as an aside, uh, you want to get access to a private property on a class? Uh, just use bracket notation and you can do that. 
So <laughs> it's a little naughty, but, but you know, sometimes if you have to work around something and you have to reach in and, and do that, you know, put to do, fix this around there, but you, 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 you can do it. Uh, another question? Has, yeah, so the question was, has the list been uh, told about this issue? Um, I believe they have, but it's probably lost in the huge volumes of email that go there. Um, some of these issues do have JIRAs, um, and people may or may not be looking at them, but they are at least documented there. Some of them are only on the mailing list, and I know one or two probably are not there at all. So, Font support on the JS side. Um, there is no font support on JS, uh, which is a little sad, but I found an easy way of doing it, and that is to use the, um, basically an inject, inject font bead. Hi, welcome. You've come to a talk that should have been about testing, but it's not. <laughs> so what I'm doing instead is actually going through um, a case study of a real FlexJS application that has been deployed live, and I'm going through the development process and some of the issues we've run into. So we just had a couple of late people walk in. Hmm? Chris, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I'm just surprised at this. Uh, that we parsed the AS talk comment and sort of checked this inject HTML thing. Yeah. Ooh, ooh. yeah, so this this is not an obvious way to fix this, but it works. Um, I would prefer we could do this in another way. Um, having code in comments is sort of feels. You can, you can use it. Uh, what, I, what I've recently been doing is basically using a separate template for. So you can use an HTML template when you compile. Uh, so basically, any all my links and things like mm -hmm. that, I'm putting into the template. Uh, the, uh, that. Yeah, the uh, uh, um, comment from the audience was that you can actually, rather than using the generated template that it gives you, you can create your own template and you can put all the links and everything else that you need that in the header. Um, that may or may not work for you depending on the application. In our case, it, it doesn't work because that font is actually dynamic depending on the site. So uh, it actually has to be generated on the server side. Um, uh, there's a there's a couple of ways we could do that. We could do that, but the, the the main issue is that just in the FlexJS, there's no support for JS style fonts. Um, so this is one way of getting around it. Um, there are probably other ways of doing it as well. Um, missing styles. There are a lot of basic styles that, in my opinion, are missing from the probably poorly named simple CSS value implementation, or values impl. impl. Um, and generally you can get around these just by explicit, explicitly setting them. Um, this is not the best thing. The reason is that it's not likely to be cross-platform. But in our case, we're only targeting JS, not AS. So it, it makes sense for us to, to be able to do the to, do this quickly. Um, yeah, now I would love to see a minimum set of common JS styles implemented, not just the AS ones, because currently we have a set of, a subset of what the Flex SDK does, and that is basically all the AS ones, and one or two JS ones have been added to it, and there's not parity between AS and JS, and there's a whole lot of missing JS ones. Um, now, we don't have consensus on the list about how to do, how to solve this problem. Uh, it's, yeah, and it's, it's a sort of a tricky problem to solve. Um, I think eventually what I'm going to do is just go down and create a simple JS uh, value, CSS values um, and just add all the common ones there. Um, and we, we cover most of them. There's only about a dozen we're missing. I would say. Um, if you look at caniuse.com, they've got a nice document about here are all the commonly well-supported subsets of CSS 2.1 um, and we, we could go ahead and implement all of those. So uh, again, it would be more of you, it, it's more useful for people who are just targeting JS rather than JS and AS.
Yeah, so, uh, the comment was that uh, creating a massive class that has every single style in it, and that has actually been done, but you may not want to use it. Yeah, I, I, you could take that and copy it into your project and then just delete all the ones that you don't use. That means every single project has to do that and I, I, I'm not sure that's, it works for one person, I'm not sure that's scalable as a, as in terms of a framework thing. Probably the way to do it though. Yeah, it is probably the leanest way to do it, so. Um, alert is broken. I noticed you had alert working in your application. I think it, it used to be broken maybe. I try to. Yeah, I tried it last night, it was broken. So it might be a, a browser uh, issue there. I did not try it on all the browsers. Yeah. Are you using the basic component set or Express? Express. Oh, okay. Well, I was using Express too, so I don't know. Yeah, anyway, there's something odd with alert. Um, that's okay, simpler work, alert works, so just use that, we'll create your own component. Again, that was just another, another small thing. Uh, I, I did look into why alert was broken, and I'm pretty sure it's an easy fix. And I think I did suggest that on the list, but I, um, I don't think it's been done yet. So we'll have to, I'll have to look at that. That's on my list of things to do. Um, another thing, labels are not clickable, even though they have click handlers. So that bit of code there will compile fine, but do nothing. Uh, no, it's not a reason fixed. I, again, tested it last night. Well, uh, now, now, it seems to toggle backwards and forwards a bit. At one point it was working, and then it wasn't working again. Um, and I, it is by design, I believe. Uh, there's sort of some question whether labels should be lightweight and not have mouse events in it. But if it shouldn't have mouse events, then you shouldn't be able to compile this code. So uh, anyway, the way that we've got around with it is we've just used a button and we've styled away the border and background color and, and that works fine. So it's sort of a little hacky, but it, it, it works. Uh, yeah, I, um, I'm pretty sure we're using basic there, not express. So anyway, um, background alpha is broken. Um, if you say background color equals something, background alpha equals something, if you're a JavaScript developer, you would expect that to work. Ah, it doesn't. Um, we've, I've identified what needs to be fixed in the framework, but we haven't implemented that fix yet. Um, and there is a workaround for it, and that's simply to use the RGBA, uh, and you can specify the alpha at the end of the color there, and that, that, that seems to work. As I was saying, most of these issues aren't huge issues, and there are always workarounds for them. Uh, and this is more just, you know, the practical experience of what we went through and how we, we, we solved some of these problems. Ah, this was fun. <laughs> uh, there's a bug with visibility. If you, um, yeah, I, got, I see some nods in the audience there. <laughs> you know about this, yeah. Um, if something's visible, invisible, initially, you get all sorts of layout issues. It, like it doesn't take up any space, sort of. And then when you make it visible, it's all ugly. Uh, nothing is laid out correctly. And um, there's a few things you can do to sort of make this work. Um, you've got to be really careful in the order that you set things visible and invisible if you've got multiple things that you're, you're doing that. I found that if you, get the, if you do it in a different order, things break. Um, and the easiest way to get around it, and which is, again, not ideal, was to set everything to visible, wait for the application to start up, and assumingly it's measured everything by then, and then hide everything as quickly as you can. <laughs> Another comment from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think textbook way to do this, I, mm -hmm. think, I think it is by design that it's not being laid out when it's not visible, mm -hmm. is to wait for everything to load and then dispatch a layout needed event. Um, and I think it's worked for us in Okay, so some, someone else has run into this same bug, and the way that... Sorry, I'm not sure it's, it's, it's considered a bug, uh, like, you know... Yeah, it could be by design, exactly. So, but it, like, it's an issue you've run into, and the way that you've got around it is that you've made things invisible to start off with, and then dispatched a layout needed event uh, when you want to make them visible. Yeah, the layout, the layout uh, lifecycle is very different from Plex, so you have to get 
Yeah. Yeah, the layout life cycle is very different from Flex, and this is this issue has probably come about for me thinking in the Flex SDK way, and and you know not not being understanding the way that layout works in in Flex.js and visibility works in there. Um, yeah, now um, there is uh, one of the other really interesting things happens. Have you tried setting everything to false and see what happens if you turn everything off? Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Things break really badly. <laughs> um, horizontal lists, very broken. Like, so broken you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> However, there is a very simple fix. It took me a while to work this out, but it's just overflow X to auto and overflow Y to hidden, and that tends to work things out. Um, we should try and come up with some way of setting overflow via some beads, I think. I don't think there's a bead which does that yet. I know Peter made some changes when he did some of his layout changes that have changed some of this stuff. I need to look more into that and see what see what was going on there. Um, yeah, anyway. Resizing. <laughs> ah, this is fun. Anyone here have a, a, a play around with resizing and, and got it working? Yeah, okay. Ah, good. Well, there is a, there is a bead called Browser Resize Handler, um, and it works mostly. Um, it doesn't work in all cases, and in some cases I found it was easier just to manually calculate sizes on a size changed event, uh, and that would actually uh, make things correct. Do you know what situations it would work? Um, percentage widths, mostly, it seemed to be. It was where the most issues were. Um, but it, it seemed a bit random. Uh, it, it just seemed to, once you got to a certain complexity, that, that it just gave up. Um, our application is reasonably complex in terms of the number of containers and nesting and layout and so forth. Um, so it may be that there's another bug there that we, we haven't d discovered yet, and that's causing the resizing to, 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 to not work properly. So um, anyway, there's a workaround for it. Listen to size change and then uh, do something based on that. Um, as I said before, most components can't be used as MXML components. That is by design. If you come from the Flex SDK world, then this is going to take a little while to get used to. Um, it does make your code a little more verbose, uh, but you know, I, I think performance is not going to suffer uh, because of that. Um, Multi-line text with new lines doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, I tried all sorts of things to get this work, working, um, and eventually what I just came up with is just oh, don't use plain text, just use HTML and put BRs in there. That just seemed the easiest and simplest way to, 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 to work around it. Uh, so we'll, uh, again, I'll have to come back and have a, have a look at that. Um, scroll events are actually not dispatched by the scroller. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, that, that wasted a little bit of time. Um, so, but however, as I was saying before, uh, because Flex.js doesn't enforce the public-private details, you can actually reach in uh, to the scroller and get at the scroll events. Um, this is probably one of the ugliest hacks that we had to do so far. Um, I certainly wouldn't recommend this, and I'm going to try and find another way of, of either fixing this or getting a, a, a workaround for it. Um, but it's, it's nice to know, again, that the framework is flexible enough that even when you do run into issues, you can relatively easily find, find a way to, 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 to fix it, even if it's a little ugly. So. so have you made Jira issues for these? I have made Jira issues for just about every single one of these, yes. Yeah. Um, if you change uh, the visibility, uh, the contents inside a container move around. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think this has improved, but I don't think it's been 100% fixed. Um, and I noticed the workaround used to be to set the X and Y to zero, rather than not having them set at all. Um, Yeah, this used to, to actually use absolute positioning, and I think recent changes to the SDK have changed that. So it may be that this one is fixed. I didn't try this uh, yesterday to see whether it had been fixed or not. So. 
Almost there. <laughs> percentage X and Y values. Ah, this is great. You've got percentage width and percentage height are supported, but you don't have percentage X and Y. Um, so you can't mix percentage, and you also can't mix percentages and absolute values together, which is often what you want to do. You want to say, I want a padding of 20 on the left-hand side, padding of 20 on the right-hand side, and I want the rest to fill up the entire browser. So in Flex SDK world, you would say set it that to 100%. Um, if you do that in Flex.js, you get ugly scroll bars <laughs> on your browser. Um, and it will add up to 100% of the browser width plus 40 pixels. It's, it's the way JS works. It's just one of those things. Um, so you're going to have to come up with other ways of, of working that out. We really need a constrained layout to solve this problem. Yeah, we need a constrained layout to solve this problem, was a, a comment from the audience. And that's correct. Uh, font weight. Um, this has been fixed in the SDK. Um, it took some discussion <laughs> to be able to fix this um, because uh, the ActionScript side of things do not support uh, numeric font weights, uh, but the JavaScript side does support numeric font weights. Um, so that's, that's a nice thing. Um, this is the last one. Um, sometimes, no matter what you do, you'll still get scroll bars showing up in your browser. Um, so uh, just remove them. <laughs> that's, it's not particularly, again, the, the nicest way to do it, uh, but that's what you have to do to, to sort of move on and get, get, you know, get your code out and put it into production. So I think that's just about all the issues that we ran into over the last three months. Um, as I said, every single one of them we managed to find a workaround for, um, and we still had you know, reasonably high productivity even with the, the few of the issues that we, we did run into. Hey. So um, observations on the last three months of working on this application. Um, there are issues. Some of them need workarounds, um, but mostly it just works. Um, so it is definitely FlexJS you can use in production. Uh, you can use it to make things now and to deploy. Uh, you've just got to be aware that there are going to be some issues that you run into and you're going to have to spend a little bit of time uh, working those out. Um, compared to the Flex SDK or even coding in JavaScript, the code ends up a little more verbose. Um, but I, I, it's not hugely so, and I, and I think that's okay. Um, Errors are caught really early, just one typing in the IDE, depending on the IDE you're using. Um, I happen to use IntelliJ, and it actually tells you the errors before it even compiles things. So that's, that's sort of quite nice. Uh, or if you're not using IntelliJ, uh, or uh, uh, I think Flash Builder will detect some of the errors, but um, if you're compiling at compile time, you, you, know, you get errors, and it'll, it'll tell you, no, you've, you know, you've done something wrong here. And that, again, I think is a huge huge productivity boost. Um, layout is relatively easy. Uh, you don't have to mess a lot with CSS to get good layout. Uh, you can just use the groups and containers and nest them together. Uh, styling via CSS is also relatively easy, so you've sort of got the best of both worlds there, uh, particularly if you're only targeting JavaScript. Um, you will run into browser differences. We've run into a few, uh, not quite as many as I thought we would, but um, you make sure you test on all browsers. Um, button sizes was one of the things I ran into. Button sizes vary hugely on, on different platforms. And um, yeah, you've got to be a little careful with that. Um, performance is uh, good or excellent, even. Uh, all the animations and so forth work fine. Uh, even if you're running on the debug version, I found. Um, currently, um, I just tried it with Chris earlier today. Um, our, uh, we can't even compile a release version of our application currently. There's some circular dependency or, or some other issue that we've got there. Um, so we've actually just deployed the debug version um, till we can fix that up. Um, as a result, the applications tend to be a little bit on the large side, but they're probably smaller than the equivalent uh, Flex SDK application. So, so that's all good. Um, the other thing that has happened over the last three months is that things change. And uh, we've had a lot of layout changes with uh, containers and groups. Uh, that's, that's mostly been a positive thing. Things have greatly improved in that direction. Uh, padding and margin stuff has mostly been fixed, but still there's still some issues there. 
Um, the recent dual branch that got merged into develop a couple of weeks ago, um, compile times have significantly increased, um, which I would be nice if something could be done about that, but I, I don't know that there is something. Um, it's just changed the way before you could either compile for AS or you can compile for JS. Now it's sort of compiling for both. And the fact is we don't need the AS part of it, but we have to incur the cost of doing that because that's, that's what it's doing. Question down there? Uh, we are saying we only want the JS, yeah. okay. and and it's still slower. <laughs> yeah. So um, the um, that all changed also meant that your Maven POMs had to significantly changed um, because the the actual compilation name type, whatever you want to call it, changed from like JS to FlexJS. Uh, that wasn't well documented or wasn't communicated on the list very well, and that, that saved us, uh, sorry, that cost us about half a day of development time, uh, which was a, a little ugly until we worked out what exactly what the issue was. Um, so a little bit about the project it, itself on other things on, on the last three months that we've gone on to. So it's going to undergo a security audit, so security is sort of important. Uh, so we needed to make sure that, that only uh, logged in users could actually call the backend calls. Um, and you know, the DB is not publicly accessible, it's behind a firewall, so that's good. We have to worry about things like uh, SQL injection attacks, uh, security. Part of the functionality is file uploads as well, so we have to be very careful about that, that you know, people don't upload malicious files to, the, to, to our application and then uh, do something about that. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but the one thing I will go into is the sort of the back-end services and the security around that. So the backend we have um, supports both JSON and AMF uh, with the same code base, which is sort of quite nice. Um, the AMF is used by the existing mobile application, and the JSON is used by this new desktop application. Um, it works as expected, minimal code required, um, after we have sorted out some cause issues, uh, which was reasonably complex. Um, uh, we also run into issues with dates, but that is almost always the case when you're transferring, dealing with multiple time zones and transferring dates back and forwards. That's not a, a problem unique to FlexJS. Uh, so cores, Does everyone here heard of cores and the, the understand a little bit about the security that is in, inside browsers? Okay, so basically it, in a browser, um, it, it will only allow it to request certain resources from the server that it was served from. It can't go connecting third-party servers and, and make requests to, to, to those um, under certain circumstances. So um, if you come from the Flex SDK world, um, you might remember the way that you got around this was with a cross-domain policy. And you would take the cross-domain policy and you would place it up on the server, um, and that would be all you, you'd have to do. With cores, you've got to make changes to both the client side and the server side, uh, which makes it a little more complex. Uh, it is reasonably straightforward once you know what's going on. And on the server side, there are two headers that you need to set, which is um, access control allow origin and access control allow credentials. Um, the allow credentials is required if you want to pass cookies or basic authentication. Um, so if you are trying to secure your back end, you basically need to do that. On the client side, uh, you need to set uh, with credentials uh, to be true for the, the calls that you need it to be. Um, we have, uh, I have added a cause bead and method to, uh, to do this in, into the Flex uh, FlexJS framework. Um, currently, however, there is a bug in how beads are added and removed, uh, which means it's not 100% perfect for working. The, the, it will work for you if it's in there, but once that bug is fixed, we can remove some code and make it a, a little cleaner. Um, so a little bit about our de development environment. As I was saying when I first came onto this project, um, yeah, it was a single developer. Uh, they used no version control and just FTP'd everything up to a live server. So, um, so this is what we've currently got set up. We're using IntelliJ as a, an IDE. It's a little complex to set up and it's not perfect. 
Uh, you can't effectively debug stuff in IntelliJ, for example. Not that I've been able to work out anyway. Um, it's really good to see Josh's talk and the fact that you can debug stuff in in your IDE, that, and particularly with the map files as well. That was that was nice. So uh, I, I, I may have a look at that. I think um, we command compile via Maven via command line, uh, and you can run stuff locally. So that's 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 nice. Uh, we do run into browser security issues when doing that, so you need to disable security and launch browsers via the command line with a few options as well. Um, when you're debugging, I mostly use Chrome, and you can set breakpoints in that, debug variable names, look at things, and it's, it's decent enough. Um, you're debugging the generated JS output rather than the action script itself, and that means that it's not identical. But mostly there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, um, and you can very easily work out where the bug in the action script is to, to where the Java is, is. For more complex issues, you know, that may not be the case, but it, it generally is a, is a good thing. Um, it's really easy to debug remote calls in, in Chrome as well. You can filter on them, set breakpoints on them when they get called, see the, all the headers that come backwards and forwards and so forth, so that, that's a really nice environment to do that. Um, I occasionally use um, a reverse proxy uh, called Charles as well to have a look at the traffic. Um, we use GitHub for version control. Uh, again, before I started on this project, they didn't have any of this. So we're using that for version control issues, uh, projects and milestones, and we're likely to move to a self-hosted instance of GitLab at, at some point. Uh, we use Maven to build stuff. It's fast. It works. Mostly. When? Things aren't broken, <laughs> but Chris Chris is very very responsive to that and uh, cleans up messes that other people make occasionally to get it working again. Um, it has changed a few times uh, due to framework changes. Um, you just got to keep on top of that, uh, but it's not it's not too hard to fix. Uh, we use Jenkins as well, uh, and you can actually do quite a lot with Jenkins. I, I've I've forgotten how powerful it actually is. Um, we've got it running on Linux, so you can actually compile the SDK on Linux. Um, that took a little bit of effort, and I had to, to, to put in a couple of patches to, to get that to work. Uh, but yeah, you can get Flex.js running on Linux, you can compile things on Linux, which is a, a really good thing, even with versions of the Flash Player that you may not expect. There's a little hack to that, but I'll, 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 if you want to know about that, come speak to me afterwards. So we've got, uh, basically, on check-in to GitHub, where the whole project compiles and it gets FTP'd up to the development server. Uh, so the development server always contains the, the very, very latest code, so we can very easily test things. Uh, we also run Sonacube. Uh, if people are not familiar with Sonacube, use it. It's a really, really nice tool. And it's free. <laughs> um, we also keep the last 20 builds, just in case something has been broken in the in the Flex.js, so we can revert to any one of those builds at any point in time if we need to. That's just a nice little safety feature. Um, we also have some Jenkins jobs that deploy to um, production in one single step. So um, that's also another nice feature. So there's no manual FTPing around or any other, that, other silliness. Uh, and it also means that anyone can, on the team can do this, not only people who only have access to the, 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 the server. Um, we're using HipChat. We're a bit of a distributed team. Uh, while there are, there's two programmers working on the front end, there's one programmer working on the mobile side, and we have a, the person who's running the project, who's also uh, the designer. Um, we're in four different states, two different countries, and four different time zones. They're not too far apart, but but you know that does make for some some uh, confusion. <laughs> Um, and we've got this uh, HipChat with Jenkins and GitHub integration, so we can see everything that goes on as well. Um, Slack can also do similar things to this, so, and I don't care with, you know, use HipChat with Slack, but this has been a really great uh, way of communicating with the rest of the team, and, and um, it's, it's really helped the project. Um, and we also use uh, Sonicube, and that basically tracks code quality, looks for security bugs, um, and I, we currently we don't have it set so that if we, it won't stop things going to development environment. 
Um, it reports on JS and AS files, but it doesn't currently parse MXML files. Uh, so we're thinking about using uh, sort of the code behind technique, if you've ever run into that. You make an MXL file, you make an AS file with the same name and include it. So we, we, we could at least get all the AS code um, uh, parsed for this. Uh, Sonicude is really easy to, to run locally uh, uh, as well. Um, so that's just about it. So what's next? Well, there's going to be further development. We're, as I said, we're making releases about every two weeks. Um, we currently have about six sites. Uh, so there's going to be, in the next couple of months, up to a dozen sites, and there's going to be lots of differences between those sites. So there's going to be more feature toggles and more styling differences between them. Um, we're going to try and fix a few bugs we found with the compiler in SDK, and SDK, and uh, we've just uh, been focusing more on getting a first release out. Um, what I really like to do is get FlexUnit working properly and get uh, unit testing and that integrated with the CI. Um, so hopefully next ApacheCon, that's what my talk will be about. Um, and we also want to grow the team. So um, yeah, we're looking for new people. If you're interested, come have a word with me. So that's it. Uh, do we have any more questions? One for Chris. It's not the build of the framework part, it's the build of applications using the framework that have increased. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much.